each week we sit down with some of your favorite black creatives in Hollywood to discuss how they made it in the entertainment industry. And this week, we're speaking with the one and only Janet Mock. You likely know her from a number of different things, but she got her start in the entertainment industry first as a writer, director, and producer on FX's Pose. And since then, she's gone on to be a part of a number of Ron Murphy produced projects, such as The Politician and Hollywood, which are both on Netflix. Janet made history with her groundbreaking producing deal at Netflix, and soon she's going to film her directorial debut, Scandalous, which is starring Emmy nominee Jeremy Pope as Sammy Davis Jr. We talked to Janet, who had an extensive career in journalism before getting into the entertainment industry, about what made her want to get behind the scenes and begin producing, writing, and favorite television shows. The first time I ever got a spark of like an interest was really just digging deeper into uh, Zora Neale Hurston's life. It, this is a big roundabout tangent, but uh, <laughs> thinking how you know Alice Walker uncovered her, brought her back to her you know rightful place in the American literary canon, mm -hmm. um, and thinking how Alice herself, with her career in *The Color Purple*. Uh, that was such a book that was so important to me in a movie that obviously is so precious to black folks. Yes. But her journey of, you know, not only writing the novel, but then adapting it uh, for Steven Spielberg's film, I was always inspired by that. So I always thought, oh, maybe that's the way that I'll get into TV and film someday is yeah. through my own book that I could possibly adapt with some director. Mm. Uh, Pose in 2017 coming into my life was just a huge surprise. Yeah. I hadn't even really thought or gave deeper insight into that. You know, really at that point, I, I had just finished my contract with MSNBC. I had mm -hmm. shot a pilot uh, for CNN where I was traveling around the world and mm -hmm. talking about gender, which they didn't pick up. And so I was like, what am I gonna do next? I already have two books out. I don't wanna write another memoir. And then yeah. boom, Ryan Murphy requested a meeting with me. And yeah. that's kind of how I got into the <laughs> Yes. So we are coming up on this final season of Pose. It's so bittersweet because um, I feel like it's just been, it's been such a gift um, to television. And I know that, you know, you and the creative team have talked about in statements prior about, you know, this being the moment to end the show and concluding at this moment. But can you speak more to the decision behind thinking, okay, this is the story you want to tell, and we think this is it. Um, and even if you, if there were any hints of even attempting to, you know, think that there could be another life for it. Yeah, I think you said it right. Bittersweet. That's the word I keep coming back to. I think that there is so much story, so much more that we could tell, right? We could introduce new characters, older faves, and all of that stuff. And I think that when we really embarked on the third season. I remember one of our first arguments back and forth and discussions, heated discussions was, you know, how are we ending the series? And mm -hmm. what year and time frame? And because I, I'm not a co-creator of the show and I will, you know, uh, we're very, you know, uh, very democratic in our room. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, Stephen uh, Canals, Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk they created this show. And so they had an original vision for it, which did shift and change based on casting, based on me coming into the room, based on Our Lady J joining our room, based on actors' talents, all kinds of things, right? That shift and change a television show's kind of trajectory from the original vision. But the original vision always was to end on a specific yeah. And we knew that the way that our show is usually structured uh, for our episodes, that we were gonna hit that year in this season. Mm -hmm. So the time of it all, the original time and intent that Stephen and Ryan and Brad discussed was approaching. And so that became a very clear <laughs> understanding. <laughs> We're going to end this season. We knew that within the first month of when we started meeting um, wow. in the fall of, oh my God, this is so strange. The fall of 2019 <laughs> is when we started writing the show. Uh, and at that point, the second season had just finished airing that summer. And so we were like, oh shit. And we felt like we were just getting our groove. And for me, you know, I was like, I could do this show for another five seasons. You know, I had, <laughs> I had like 400 pitches. I got all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. It felt right. It felt right for these characters. It felt right for Blanca's journey specifically because she is who, you know, the show's shoulders falls on is MJ. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, yeah, that kind of was the decision making process of it. Yeah, yeah. And I would love to go back to your uh, directorial debut um, in the first season um, of Pose. And I feel like it's one of the most impactful episodes of television. And I think because of that, it gives this sort of balance between, you know, the seriousness and the heaviness of talking about HIV and AIDS, but then also the joy of that moment that also that kind of gets lost sometimes in the narratives that we've seen before to come out of this time period and moment in history. And I feel like that's kind of lasted all throughout the show, kind of like the balance between, you know, this is heavy, but you know, people were still living their best lives and had fun and were dealing with what was going on in the best way they could. So how important was it for you over the course of this series to show these contrasting moments in order to get this full, like holistic experience of what was going on with these people um, during this time period? You know, for me, it really was all about going back to all the conversations I had with my people and I have with my people, Mm -hmm. right? We go through today, today, you know, we go through some of the most horrendous experiences, the most triggering experiences, the microaggressions, the headlines, the latest body that has fallen, the latest black body specifically that has fallen, not even Mm. to mention, you know, the queer and trans intersections of that blackness and the violence that we face, right? Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about when I sit with my sisters and my siblings and we're talking and we're sharing space. We're not sitting and talking about the heaviness of the world. Yes, we will touch upon it, but overwhelmingly the conversations that we're having are about what do you want in life? Girl, how are you gonna get it? Sis, yes, you can do it. That's what I'm talking about, but you need to fix your hair face at first. Oh, you're a little ashy right now. <laughs> All of it. And so mm-hmm. I think really the, the tone of the show came out of those conversations that we were just naturally having specifically, and I will say between me and Steven. You know, mm-hmm. we have a rapport and a cackle and a giggle that is no like any other. No one can penetrate that bond that we've had and we've, we've had it for three seasons. It felt as if, you know, when I met him for the first time in um, August, 2017, right? Like a couple weeks after I first met Ryan in July, <clears throat> um, Steven was the clincher for me. When I met him, mm. the whole project made sense to me. I got it. Like I was like, I got it. You're from the Bronx. You're cool. mm-hmm. You're, you know, Afro Latinx. Like all of these things were connecting. You grew up in this time period. You knew this New York City, even though you were a little younger at the time. You love Paris is burning. You have a reverence for our people. You love our people. You love us. Like for me, and so like for us, that's where the tone comes from. It comes from those conversations that we've had with each other. Um, And so for us, it's always don't forget the light as people are living in the shadows, right? Yeah. Also, the aim of what we tried to do with the series um, has always been about being true to the community, being true to uh, the actors and their experiences, listening to them. You know, we had a different tone for the show because Ryan shot, if people remember, Ryan shot uh, the first two episodes. And that was kind of our pilot to Mm -hmm. see if I get picked up by FX. Um, And we had a different, the tone for the show was a lot more gritty. It was a Mm. lot darker. And then we met the actors and we're like, this is not who they are. This is not who we are. And it shifted Mm. and changed the show. And so for me, you know, um, being able to be so deeply involved in the series um, and being a foundational piece and creator, um, creative voice in the series, you know, directing was just a natural was just a natural transition for me. It wasn't one that I had plotted and planned for, uh, but that script felt right for me. Um, I felt so grateful to have, you know, India Moore and Kate Mara and Billy Porter, who are really the central pieces of that episode, um, to be able to play with them and create with them on my first ever, you know, directing experience. And I can't believe how I've gone on to do another what nine ten hours of television since then. Yeah. but pose was the pose was the experiment and pose was the grad school and pose was the film school for me mm-hmm. all those things yeah it's like it's you you don't really see that too often with a, a show being such a launch pad um not only for people behind the scenes but just thinking about how 
this show has launched the careers of uh, India and um, propelled MJ to superstar. And then you have um, so so many um, figures. Like, how does that feel for you as a creative behind the project that you're going to see all of these talented actors and actresses go on from this show and, you know, be that representation um, in other shows and other narratives um, and mostly, hopefully, just existing and not being like so um, typecast as we've seen in history. You know, I, I learned so much um, and even though I thought that I knew a lot, but from Disclosure on Netflix and how, you know, Pose was so revolutionary in that aspect. When you, you step back and think, you know, oh, this is really the only time that I've seen this on television. You're looking to see it's the same thing over and over and over again. So for you as a creative behind the show, when you, you're you putting these actresses in like superstardom um, level, how does that feel? It's the sweet of the bittersweet, right? The mm -hmm. show ending now gives them an opportunity to truly spread their wings. We can mm -hmm. truly see how inclusive and diverse and about it is the industry, right? Because when the show started in 2017, it was just radical in the notion and revolutionary that we cast five black trans women as black trans women on a show that was going to center them and their voices and their experiences. Mm -hmm had never been done before. I completely get it. Um, and people like, we'll see, we'll see if that's successful. We'll see if that works. It worked. It was critically acclaimed. The audience loves it. The people love it. It doesn't get huge numbers, but it's a beloved show. Mm -hmm. uh, now these actors, you know, and we cast all unknowns. No one had had really anything that was substantial. Billy Porter, even who would be our most known name on it at the time, had a lot of stage experience, but not a lot of on-camera experience. So everyone in terms of television was unknown. We were working mm. with a lot of unknown talent. And so there was a lot of unknowns, like what was what is gonna happen? Like, is the show gonna be successful? And it turned out, of course, to be a successful show. Um, and now there's no excuse for the industry to not cast these actors because they have 25 episodes under their belt. Mm. They have three seasons under their belt. They've been to the Emmys, the Golden Globes, the Critic Choice Awards. They've been seen, they've been on magazine covers, they have campaigns, they have all the things you can think of. They have voices, they have experiences. So they should all be cast <laughs> <laughs> across the board in all these TV and film projects that are in the works and in development. Um, and so I'm excited to see that. But I also know the structural issues with this industry, the systemic issues that block gatekeepers, specifically white, cis, heterosexual gatekeepers mm -hmm. from seeing us, from seeing our talents. And I think it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I think that none of the actresses on our series have been recognized in the acting categories. I think that there is a misconception for folks when they watch our series, they think that it's a documentary. They think that these women are just living their lives on screen and we turn on a camera. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> they are going deep into their well of craft and tools and experiences to bring life to the scripts that we write for them. It's not their lives. Some of the mm -hmm. stuff we pulled from stories we heard from them but they're not, they're acting their asses off. They're carrying uh, it. Oh, so they're, and it's specifically for someone like MJ. It's just, to me, it's, she's one of the most underrated, overlooked talents. And I think, you know, for our series, it makes sense because mothers never get credit for the work that mm. they do. You're supposed to raise a child. You're supposed to let it shine. You're supposed to, you know, stand back and just applaud. And I find it frustrating for me personally yeah. that she hasn't gotten her flowers. She hasn't gotten a nomination from the Emmy. She hasn't been recognized by the Golden Globes. It's it's wild to me. And to me, it always speaks to the systemic gaps of understanding of what these actors do on this show, mm -hmm. um, that it takes actual craft and tools and a deep well of knowledge and experience to bring life to, to this show. Yeah, and it makes me think about, I read an article the other day um, leading into the Oscars about Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis being nominated for My Rain's Black Bottom, but like, you know, then the film itself didn't really didn't get an Oscar nomination and its director, George C. Wolfe, didn't get a nomination either. And I think it's kind of like the inverse when we speak about Pose because, you know, 
it, it'll get like the the acclaim for the show itself but it's like how do you give the claim to the show itself if you don't recognize the person that's at the heart of this show it's it just it seems kind of backwards and you know it's the same thing with the again the craft piece right mm -hmm. like writing and directing on the show hasn't been recognized either yeah yeah you know it's an interesting thing it's like they'll it's just they'll I often feel sometimes with the industry, they'll do the bare minimum to be mm -hmm. like, we've saved ourselves. Like we've done it, like this is all we need to do. <laughs> do. And then, so, so when you're looking back through history and you're like, okay, did they honor Pose the way she's like, oh yeah, we gave Billy all these noms and we, know we, we, we shouted them out occasionally for a series, but did you actually honor it like it should have been and like you know that's why I was so I was so glad that MJ um got a nomination for um CCA I think last I think it was last um season which was the which was the season where she should have you know been been one of the the sweepers in that category but it also brings into conversation and I'm interested for your perspective as a creative on you know how do you gauge success and impact while still trying to not seek too much validation from this structure and system that Hollywood is. Cause I feel like it's hard sometimes because, you know, and I feel like we have this conversation a lot in the, in I guess black film and television community about like not wanting to put, you know, so much, um, there's so much power into these systems, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to tell a creative that, you know, if they get nominated, it doesn't mean anything because that could open up so many doors for them. Um, but at the same time, you know, how do you, you know, toe the line between getting recognition, but also realizing that that doesn't make or break the impact of something like Pose? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like when it's my day to day conversations about the series is never about like the awards. right? <laughs> it's always about the work. And so for me, I am very clear and focused that the work that we're doing and what we actually put on the screen is what matters. How do mm. people feel? Does it feel authentic? Does it feel real? Does it feel grounded? Does it resonate? Is it coming from a true place, right? Those are yeah. always the questions that I'm asking myself as I'm directing, as I'm writing, as we're breaking story, as I'm producing other directors on set. Um, and so for me, that's what's important is the work. It's the legacy work of the show. I think that who it should matter to is the industry, <laughs> mm -hmm. what I really believe. I say that the awards are um, reflective of where we're at as an industry in the time period, mm. right? Who we choose to highlight, who we choose to uplift, who we choose to say and give that moniker, right? Of Golden Globe winning actor, Golden yeah. Globe, you know, Emmy winning actress, whatever it is, right? We know that there is monetary rewards that come with that. There's pay raises that come with winning an Emmy or a Golden Globe with a network. So mm -hmm. to me, again, we're talking about systems, um, a system that is not able to truly see, engage the work of the actors, not only because, um, and I'm speaking specifically about the trans women on the show, uh, specifically because they're women, <laughs> They're black mm -hmm. and they're trans, right? There's just so many gaps in there that I think doesn't allow folk to truly see them, um, mm -hmm. to see us. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I kind of feel about the awards. I know that they're important. They're important because of course there's validation and affirmation. Of course you wanna be embraced and applauded by your uh, colleagues across the industry. Um, but I think at the end of the day for us, it's always, at least for me, it's always gonna be about what we put on screen because that's what we'll be judged on forever long after we're, we're not here. This week's Black Entertainment Trivia Fact. Who is the first and the only Black actor to have received two Academy Award acting nominations in the same year? Is it Jamie Foxx, Angela Bassett, Viola Davis, or Sidney Poitier? Find out the answer next week on Shadownact.com. We talked about the the talent moving on after the show was over with and doing um, presumably so many great things after that. But what do you think um, the future is of stories like Pose being told in Hollywood, specifically from this lens, um, this POC lens, this black lens, um, 
you know, it lends from you and Steve and folks like that in stories that um, aren't really shown on television. You know, Pose was so groundbreaking. It was black, groundbreaking for black LGBT communities. It was groundbreaking for black trans communities. Uh, how do you think stories will continue to look like in this vein after Pose is done? I don't know. <laughs> and that's my short answer. <laughs> I loved Noah's Ark. Yeah. You know? And when did we get another black queer show? It probably wasn't until Pose. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like it hasn't been done before in different iterations. It's just, you know, how interested are the gatekeepers <laughs> to actually making that content? You know, I have a lot of friends who've been in development hell uh, for a while on projects that are just as evocative and relevant um, and fresh and unseen um, and knew that, you know, as poses that mm -hmm. haven't been able, even in a post-pose world, if we're talking about the industry, that haven't been greenlit, that haven't been shot, that haven't gone beyond the development of a pilot phase. Uh, and so I don't quite know yet. That would be my short answer. <laughs> you know, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful now that, you know, both Stephen and I, after, you know, our second season, uh, after two seasons on the show, we both got overall deals. He's with you know Disney and, and Fox, and um, and I'm of course with with Netflix. And so there is empowerment that comes from that, right? There's a investment in us and our voices. Obviously, Stephen and I are not enough, right? Issa Rae and Lena Waithe and you mm -hmm. know Misha Green are not enough. I just hope that we keep creating more and more content, and that. Um, you know, more and more of us become the gatekeepers, I think is also yeah. essential, is that yeah. it's not enough to just have the creatives. We also need the executives who sit in those first meetings with us, who are actually nodding and affirming us and then going back and fighting for us after those meetings are over, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's layers to all of this. Yeah. And I want to talk about Hollywood for a moment because I felt like that was such a big moment of last year. And I felt like it was the it was one of the first series of the pandemic and quarantine where we were like, okay, we're in this for a long time. <laughs> so I feel like it would always it's gonna always mean something to me because it was one of the shows that I was covering <laughs> at that time. And um you wrote and directed um on the show, and I know that you specifically had a hand in the stories of both Camille and Archie on the show. And I want to ask, how do you approach projects such as, you know, from Pose to Hollywood to the politician to all the other projects that you have in development? What's the thing that makes you look at a project differently from your last one? Do you put on a different lens for that project? Do you do you view them all the same, but like, you know, different versions of your journey? Um, how, how does that work approaching that as a creative? For me, it's always... The first question I ask myself is, can I see myself in this? Where am I? Mm -hmm. uh, it's always about, for me, locating myself in the narrative. Um, I think, you know, the only experience that I didn't ask that question to myself was that uh, the first season of The Politician, uh, the episode that I directed, you know, Ryan is such a great champion and supporter and really my first mentor. Um, and he was just very clear and he's very clear about his vision and his strategy. And he said, now you need to do something that's completely out that no one would even understand, right? You did love is the message, you know, season one. <laughs> now, now go do a show that has nothing to do with you or your experiences. I was like, wait, what? And so <laughs> the politician script and I read it, I was like, okay, great. I can do this. I was in high school once. I was ambitious. I still mm -hmm. located myself in the project, you know? And, you know, for me, that was my way in. But every time it's always that. Uh, specifically with Hollywood, I was so excited to do a glamorous period piece that had something to say. That was mm -hmm. exciting for me. And, you know, I we were breaking, I think, season two um, of Pose. We're breaking and writing season two of Pose when I saw Ryan and Ian Brennan, who's the co-creator of Hollywood, going into mm -hmm. their own writer's room. I was like, what are they working on? What are they doing? And they're like, oh, it's a secret project. It's about 1950s Hollywood. And I was like, oh, OK. Because I love like, the Gilded Age of Hollywood. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Um, and, you know, uh, Ryan then had like casual conversations with me about it. And he was like, we're thinking about casting this actor named Jeremy Pope. Have you seen him? And I had seen him um, in Ain't Too Proud. 
mm-hmm. on Broadway and he just sparkled, you know? Yeah. Uh, and once he said, and then he invited me into the room and he was like, will you join the room and write these two episodes and you can direct them? And I was like, love that, perfect. Um, so yeah, for me, it's always, how do I find myself in it? Um, and does it have something to say? I think mm-hmm. is the, is a big thing. Like what is the commentary? What What is the feeling and, um, you know, the feeling that you're gonna leave people with? And I think with Hollywood, we had a great opportunity uh, to rewrite history in an interesting way without negating the fact that, you know, white supremacy and racism existed at that time, in yeah. a, even in Los Angeles and Hollywood, uh, that this industry was creating really strange projects at the same time while also trying to, you know, do projects like Carmen Jones and mm-hmm. Orgeen Best and all of these things. And so for me, it was just to be able to pull into that stuff and to give people the new generation, at least the current generation, uh, little like a little syllabus to follow of like films and you know just by mentioning you know Disney Song of the South, people ask me, wait, you guys mentioned that like was that a real thing? It was like yes, Disney released the movie <laughs> Song of the South that was a celebration of antebellum, yeah. you know, uh, South. And so, but yeah, that's my long-winded answer to you. <laughs> and speaking of Jeremy Pope, you know, we are so excited about your feature directorial debut, Scandalous. I know that, you know, we can't talk too much about it, but like just in general, like, can you give us a tease of what to expect and what you're excited uh, so much about your your first big screen effort and such a story that's um going to be interesting and like, you know, I, I, I can already just picture him as Sammy Davis Jr. And I'm just already, I'm already stating. <laughs> so what what are you excited the most about uh, bringing this project to life? You know, really uh, it's the two-hander between Sammy Davis uh, and Kim Novak. You know, they were both at uh, interesting pivots in their careers. You know, she of course had had a string of box office successes. Um, you know, starting from, you know, the picnic all the way to Vertigo. Um, mm-hmm. And she was a 24 year old woman at the time where we locate her in the film in 1957. And she's the top box office draw of all of Hollywood, male, female, <laughs> like just, she was it. She mm-hmm. was dominating in the mid fifties. And the fact that when she connects with Sammy, um, they connect and it becomes this love story that really is this us against the world kind of thing that you then get to have all this commentary around race, around the power of choice and agency when you're owned by a studio, specifically with her storyline. And with Sammy, he hadn't done film yet. He hadn't you know, been a part of the rec pack, wasn't around yet. He was friends with Frank Sinatra, but it was a pre the pre Sammy that we didn't, we didn't, mm-hmm. the Sammy that was going to become Sammy. And the way that their story kind of ends for me, their love story ends, everyone knows that they don't end up having a happily ever after. <laughs> um, but it allows them to then go and have these diverging paths that I think really uh, shaped how they, how their careers and their legacies look like. And so for me, it's the love story of it all. I love love stories. I love two handers. I love two people in a room talking (laughs) (laughs) to direct. Um, And then of course, there's the glamor of, again, the gilded age of Hollywood. Kim was the last uh, studio made movie star. She was the last. Um, And I think it really, it's a love letter to that time period and it's uh, um, a sweet goodbye uh, to two people who just connected and they saw and found something in each other that enabled them to launch themselves in a different space. And of course, working with Jeremy is just delicious. He's one of my favorite people in the world. We bonded so deeply on Hollywood. Um, I also have my Kim now, I can't announce who she is. <laughs> Um, but she's I'm anticipating my, that announcement. <laughs> one of my favorite actresses, and we're still scheduled to go and shoot that later this fall. Oh, that's so exciting. Um, there, I feel like even though we're in the middle of the pandemic, so many, you know, great projects have come from this, and people are still filming, people are still working. We shot the third season all in the pandemic. Save, yeah. Save for eight days of the premiere that I shot, that I directed. Mm-hmm. But the entire season 
we I I did th I directed three episodes. Stephen directed three episodes, and we had one guest director who was Tina Mabry, who's been mm -hmm. on since season one. Yeah, um, and she came and did one episode because she just loves our show and we just love her. Um, and so for us, like I feel like I can do nearly anything after shooting. Oof, I bet. I ambitious bet. season of television, the final season of a show. The stakes are so high um, with a cast that reflects the most vulnerable targeted populations that have been dying and hospitalized from this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we were able to tell a story about a pandemic, HIV AIDS, <laughs> with, you know, during a pandemic. And so it made everything so much alive, so much more visceral, so much more relevant. Um, yeah. But I feel I can do anything after <laughs> shooting this season. I bet. Um, it's in a pandemic. Can you, um... Your your Netflix deal, first of all, was just so um, groundbreaking, um, and it was a very um, history making moment in entertainment, television, and film. What are some other things that you are brewing up at Netflix? Can you talk to anything about that that you have coming up or projects that you'd like to do eventually? Yeah, well, I'd like to do so many things, um, but you know, I think the two that I'm concentrating on this year um, is my Janet Cook project. Yes, I remember hearing about that journalist. Uh, she is a historic figure who is still living, who is uh, very personal to me. She was, you know, when I was in uh, J school, both in undergrad and grad school, I, uh, journalism school, sorry for people. No, I got you. I'm going to say, I got you, I got you. Uh, you know, she was like this boogeyman. She was always this cautionary tale. Um, her name was always brought up, like, don't be like Janet Cook now. Don't be making up stories about stuff. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, that project is very important to me. And I also mm. have, uh, one of the first pilots I ever wrote, um, is about this trans girl who goes off to college. It's a very simple story, but it centers her in an ensemble, a young ensemble that I think it'd be super important, uh, to see. And I know Netflix is invested in both of those projects. So those are probably be the first two things that I end up doing for my, for my deal. And have you seen, you know, of course, outside of Pose, of course, but have you seen any um, narratives on television recently involving trans characters um, that you've been a fan of? Mm. Veneno on HBO Max about oh. um, uh, Christina, uh, Christina, this Spanish icon is just like one of the most personal things I've ever seen on television. Like, mm -hmm. I know all of those women. I know all of those characters. I know all of those conversations. And it shows you really that language is not a barrier to great storytelling. Like, I watched it in Spanish. I read the subtitles. I was completely <laughs> fine. And I still was crying, laughing, cackling, snapping my fingers, screaming at the screen. It's such a special, ambitious series. It's, it's so inspiring. And I love all those actors on that show. Um, I think another show, not necessarily trans, but definitely something that speaks deeply to me um, is Katori Hall's P Valley. Oh, P Valley. So, so iconic. It, it's such a special series. I think that, you know, th this character driven piece in a place and in a very specific time, this celebratory nature of black southernness, um, queerness, uh, you know, the actors are just so beautiful. Um, it's just, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yes. It, yeah. And Uncle Clifford, you know, all of them. <laughs> all of them. I, I love all of them. Mississippi is like my favorite. I'm just like, please just pick her a central character. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, with that actress, Shannon Thornton, I think her name yes, is. That's, but yes. It's just like, oh, I love that series so much. Uh, that's another one that yeah. just sticks with me. I've been, you know, I know they talked about it. I mean, of course, things have changed um, over the past few months, but I know, I think Katori did an interview talking about season two, and she was like, I mean, so many of our scenes are so intimate that we have to you know, make sure that everything is really handled um, before we go back. And I'm like, I really hope we can get it this year because I need to see more P-Valley. It, it's so good. I'm, I'm, it's one of those shows, it just... That, that should be a show that we're, t that we're talking about, hopefully, during Emmys. And I just, I just hope that you know, that the the governing bodies, the powers that be, um, 
can get out of a little bit of always trying to, you know, well, you know, it's a good show. Like, we'll, we'll, like it'll have critical acclaim. All the reviews will be good. They'll talk about in the the best shows of the year and all these publications. But then it it just doesn't it doesn't reflect it when it comes time to honor them. So, um, I'm a P Valley fan too. So I love that you like that. And in general, um, what do you hope that the greatest impact of Pose is like when we're 15, 20 years down the road, what do you hope people will remember the most about the show? That we get to choose our families. I think that's my simple, you know, my simplest answer. Um, I think it was a show that we didn't know when we were first writing was a family drama, but it became very clear to us after shooting those first, very first two episodes that we were writing a family drama a family mm. drama that we all needed. And when I say we all needed, black folks, queer folks, trans folks, we needed to see ourselves outside of the trauma of where we came from, uh, the people that birthed us and couldn't fully accept us, who couldn't fully see us and embrace us. Um, I think Pose is a celebration of chosen family um, and of course, you know, a love letter to all those folks that we lost to HIV AIDS, all the folks we lost to um, anti-trans, you know, antagonism um, and violence, um, and all the folks who were doing it, were doing it and doing it up um, and loved on each other when no one else loved on them. You know, for me, I mm -hmm. always say that the thing about the ballroom is the ballroom is the church. It is the black church. That is what it is. These kids have been orphaned, kicked out, you know, disowned mm -hmm. because of religion. <laughs> um, and they went and created a space for testimony, a space for congregating, a space for loving and applauding and praising and worshiping each other. Um, and I hope that people remember that and feel that in the core of it. You know, the glitter and the glamour and the music and the soundtracks, all of that is like the great, you know, candy, but I yeah. think the vegetables in it is that is that core piece of what it means to choose your people um, and to show up for them no matter what. Janet Mock talked to us about becoming a pivotal behind the scenes force, the future of accurate representation in film and TV, her upcoming projects, and so much more. Thank you for listening to this week's opening act with Janet Mock. Also, don't forget to give us a review and a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can watch this interview in full as well as catch exclusive content on lunchtable.com. Create an account and watch other Shadow and Act content such as Reel It Back and Shadow and Act Live. Until next time.